end when we're getting into the second part of this, verses four through eight. Um, four through five A, we see uh, the Trinity in full view. We'll see God, the Holy Spirit, and Christ um, given together with some of their attributes. First, uh, we see John and the seven churches. Uh, again, this John, uh, he was an eyewitness to the events of Christ, but also it, it's easy to forget. Um, John was the one disciple who Christ loved. He had a very intimate and special relationship with Christ. We see at, uh, I can't remember which meal, but at one meal that they had together, um, John lays down on Christ's lap. Um, so he had a very intimate friendship with Christ, uh, more so even than uh, Peter and uh, James. So we see uh, John here in the center as Christ's circle of love. Uh, we move out a bit to the three, the circle of privilege. Uh, that's James, Peter, and John. These were the three who accompanied Christ uh, up the mountain to his transfiguration. They got to see uh, what the other nine disciples did not get to see about Christ. Uh, then we had the 12, that circle of fellowship. Uh, that's why it's hard for us to remember some of the names of the disciples. Some of them aren't mentioned more than two or three times. Uh, they were uh, following Christ, learning from Christ, but they ne weren't necessarily in his inner circle of um, friendship and fellowship. Uh, fellowship, yes, but not privilege. Uh, then we have the 70. So in Luke, we're told that 70 um, disciples were given the gospel of the kingdom and sent out to preach to Israel. Uh, and we see these 500. So we see these different layers of uh, fellowship and ministry. And this looks to us uh, much like our friendships, our church fellowship groups. Um, and as we go further and further out, uh, missionaries that we support, things like that. Uh, but at the very center of Christ's earthly ministry, um, John was present with him, and they were, you could say, best friends. Uh, so John here is having a vision from Christ. Um, he's having a vision from his best friend, and I think it's important to look at it uh, with that idea that we see how excited John is, and he sees his best friend, who is also his God, and he calls himself a bond servant to him, and he sees that uh, he's coming back, but he gets to see him physically, and we'll see at a point that uh, that there's there's contact between them, and um, it's it's just a wonderful thing to see uh, this, and just to imagine um, John's emotion as Christ is giving this revelation to him. Um, also, John is the last living uh, disciple at this point; all others have been martyred. Uh, John is the only one who dies a natural death. So um, we see it's, he's, he's very privileged um, to be given this revelation, but he's also the last one who can carry this revelation. Uh, John, being the last living witness to Christ, is the only one with that apostolic authority to give that revelation from Christ. And he gives this to the seven churches that are in Asia. We're not going to go into this now because that's what chapters two and three are about, is the seven churches. Um, Asia can be a bit confusing. I think um, most of us understand this is Turkey, essentially. It's, it's not China, Asia. This is Middle East Asia um, between the Adriatic and the Mediterranean there. And I've got a helpful picture here. So like you can see up here is Istanbul, um, up top there by the Black Sea. Uh, it's down here. Uh, you've got Greece on the far left corner here, there over here in Turkey. And um, these aren't all the churches uh, in the area either. It's just seven. Um, he's selected seven churches which should receive this um, information. You can see here by Laodicea, there's Hierapolis and Colossae. Those are other churches that are mentioned a lot in the book of Acts. Um, so these aren't even the most prominent churches, but the character of these churches uh, required these messages from Christ that we'll see in chapters two and three. Uh, 
All right. And his message to them is grace to you and peace. Uh, again, common for these sort of benedictions in the beginning of a letter um, in this time period, um, especially in um, Greek letters at this time. But grace and peace are uh, messages of God, uh, God toward us, Christ towards us is graceful, and that gives us peace. So he's calling into mind specifically the grace of God, that they're undeserving, yet he's graceful, and that should give us peace. Um, keep in mind, these are to those seven churches, and of those seven, um, five of them have some pretty stern um, um, exhortations to return to faithfulness. Um, so the message first to them is grace and peace. Uh, that should be the message that we understand when we encounter Christ, because um, we shouldn't fear when we're in fellowship with him. Um, we share in his um, sacrifice. So grace to you and peace. That's the message. For him who is and who was and who is to come. Um, this is a common uh, Hebrew way of talking about God. It quotes from Isaiah uh, in the way that it's speaking of God's past reality, present reality, and future reality. It's another way, a more poetic one, of calling him eternal, um, the uncaused cause of all things. Uh, interestingly, in the Greek, uh, these uh, the articles are in the wrong case. They should be in a genitive case, which is basically like our objective case. Um, so instead of saying from him, uh, it's saying from he. Um, this is one reason why John is accused of having terrible grammar in the book of Revelation. But I think um, it, it's true in a lot of Greek poetry, but we can also see it in uh, our English poetry. Someone like Shakespeare, who will follow um, a pattern of a sonnet perfectly, but then he'll break the rules in one place. And the purpose of breaking that rule is to draw your attention to it. Uh, and I think that's what he's doing here. He's put it in the wrong case. It's like um, using they when we should use them or using uh, we when we should use us. It would catch your ear. It would draw your attention to it. And it would remind you of some um, important aspect that it says it's like waving a flag saying here look here he is he was and he is to come this is talking about the eternal one this is god um, also this is from the seven spirits who are before his throne uh, it can be kind of a tricky phrase to interpret uh, but important to see that this is sandwiched between god and christ um, so this isn't going to be talking about angelic beings. This is talking about the three-part deity. This is God um, in his three parts. Um, proof text for that goes back to Isaiah 11. Do I have that here? Yeah, Isaiah 11, uh, where it talks about the spirit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Um, so the Holy Spirit is talked about in a seven part um, influence where these are its influences on the Christian life. Uh, so the spirit is one in essence manifold and in influences. And this is something that, again, the book of Revelation is opening, um, opening doors that we never really understood. One thing for me, as I go through this, it's incredible is to realize that we'll get information like this on a daily basis uh, when we're together with the Lord. Uh, where we see dimly uh, as if through a glass, then we'll know even as we are known. So uh, just even these uh, unique ways of term uh, using the terminology shows that there's a lot that we don't know, we don't fully understand. Um, but this seven part uh, influence of the Holy Spirit is one that's uh, more fully brought out in Revelation than it is in any other place in Scripture, and it'll be referenced again in Revelation. And maybe at that time we'll have have time to go more into it. But uh, these seven attributes of the Holy Spirit, its realm of influence, and it's from Jesus Christ. 
So we normally think of the Trinity, we, the first person of the Trinity, God, the second person, Jesus, the third person, the Holy Spirit. Here it's out of order. We've got the first person, the third person, and then the second person. Um, the reason he's pulled the second person out from in between is likely so that he can go into more detail about him because this is the focus of the book is Jesus Christ. Um, similarly to when we're writing an essay, if we've got more evidence and facts about a certain um, proof, we're going to pull that out and do a paragraph of its own about that. That's all John's doing here is he's he's pulled it out of order not to um, not to put in any sort of hierarchy here, but so that he can give more information about Jesus. So Jesus is the emphasis here. Um, so we see that it is from Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. He's the firstborn of the dead. We already talked about witness. Um, Firstborn of the dead. Uh, this one, if you'll indulge me, uh, I have a lot of verses about this one, mostly from the book of John, because we're going to see what does John mean um, by the firstborn from the dead. But first, we're going to see that this idea of resurrection isn't unique um, to the New Testament. It isn't unique just to Israel. Um, Job is probably the oldest book of the Bible predating even Genesis, not in its content, but in its writing. Uh, in the book of Job, internal evidence tells us that this isn't coming from the influence of Abraham. There is no mention here to temples. There's no mention to any Jewish um, symbolism. Uh, this probably happened either contemporaneous or previous to Abraham in that promise. So everything that Job understands of God comes from what we know as the Noahic Bible, uh, the gospel that was passed from Adam to Noah, and basically is the word of mouth Bible. Uh, everything that they understood apart from God's um, direct revelation of scripture, uh, we can understand what they knew, what they understood about salvation um, in the book of Job. And it's a pretty complete understanding of salvation. Job here says, um, if a man dies, will he live again? A question that it, um, anticipates the answer, yes. All of my day or all the days of my struggle, I will wait until my changes come. Um, so we saw last week, uh, Eve being called the mother of all living after they were given their curse. But in that curse, they had the promise of a savior. And Job is hanging on to that promise of a savior, of a resurrection. Uh, Abraham also had that understanding in Genesis 22, when he is told to sacrifice his son Isaac. Uh, he knows that he was promised a son from God and that God can raise his son back from the dead. Uh, that's his actual reasoning as he's going through is, well, he, he promised the son. So if, if I um, am obedient and I sacrifice my son, God will raise him again. Um, so they understood resurrection so much so that as Job is going through his, um, his struggles here, he says, basically, it's not about this life. It's about the next life. Uh, I'm waiting for that time when I'm resurrected. Uh, and that, that can be something that we as Christians today hang on to as well, that uh, this life isn't where all of our dreams come true. And in fact, for those people where all of your dreams are coming true in Hollywood and all those places, they're not only more unhappy than we are, uh, they're also, uh, most of them don't have this hope of a resurrection. They live their best life now because this life now is all they have. Uh, we live this life for Christ because uh, he is what we have for eternity. That's when Paul in Romans 8 says, uh, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, the world doesn't have that hope of um, hope of glory after death. So we see Job even before Abraham um, holding on to that hope of the glory after death. Moreover, Daniel in um, chapter 12, we already read this. Um, so I'll just read the underlined. And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will wake. 
these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. So the angel who appears to Daniel on the bank of the river there in Babylon, he is telling Daniel that there will be a resurrection. Those who have died now, they will awake to everlasting life. And Paul says this again to the Thessalonians later on, that um, we won't precede those who have fallen asleep. By fallen asleep, that's a euphemism in the Greek for having died. So um, all throughout scripture, the understanding is a resurrection because this earth is so, so corrupt through sin that it can't just be fixed. It has to be recreated. And that recreation comes through um, Christ's death, but ultimately through his remaking ex nihilo, just as he did the first creation. He's going to remake the new earth and the new heavens. Uh, so we're going to trace this idea through the book of John just a bit here. Uh, can I get a volunteer to read this from John 10? I'll read it. Thank you. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. If the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Thank you. So mm -hmm. Christ came that we can have life and to have it abundantly. And the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. Um, that thief here would be uh, Satan. He has come to destroy. He has no benevolent intentions regarding humanity. Um, even those who, who choose to follow him instead, um, he has no goodwill toward them. Um, but we have a savior who has come to give us life and to give it to us abundantly. And this is not speaking of our life today. In fact, we're told that we'll have tribulation in this life. Uh, we are able to encourage each other and to have hope and to have love because we have this, uh, we have this joy in Christ that even in the midst of the most terrible persecution, we can still have joy. Um, lots of good books about that. Uh, I think during... Japanese internment, one of the soldiers um, in World War II held on to this hope of Christ. And I can't remember the name of the book, but I think it's Chained for Christ or something like that. Uh, so even in our persecutions today, um, in China, there's terrible persecution of Christians. Um, in the Muslim nations, terrible persecution. Uh, even in this life, we don't have to be depressed and unhappy um, about our life, because just like Job, we hold on to that hope of a future restoration where all of the hopes and dreams that we have today that aren't coming true, they will be completely fulfilled in Christ in our resurrected bodies. Next, and this is a short one. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So this is Christ talking to his disciple, or talking to, uh, where is this, John 11? Talking to, I believe, Martha. Uh, and he is asking her, um, do you believe in this resurrection? I'm coming to tell you uh, that there will be life even if you die. And that that doesn't make sense to um those who don't know Christ, but we know that we have life in Christ after death. Uh, after a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. Um, again, the future tense of this in uh, the Greek speaks not just this life. In fact, it, it, it doesn't speak of this life. It talks about um, life again, not a continuation of this life. Uh, it's just one of the semantic differences in Greek that uh, this means another life, another future life. Uh, this is our life after death with Christ. Uh, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have 
uh, you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Uh, we see this final overcoming again in the book of Revelation. Uh, we see all these, uh, these tribulations put to an end. And can I have someone read this verse from 1 Corinthians? Any volunteers? But now Thank Christ you. has been raised. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Sorry. you're fine. <laughs> okay, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. Thank you. So in 1 Corinthians, Paul gives us a very complete kind of a just a logical argument of here's everything that we've seen in Old Testament revelation about the resurrection. And um, John has given it to us in the, uh, the gospel of, Revel or of John. The gospel of John was also likely the last gospel written. He spent the most time crafting his, his arguments. And it's, it's one of the more uh, beautiful ones to read. It's not just a history. It's not part of the synoptic gospels. It's, um, that's giving us arguments for Christ's uh, kingship, for his humanity, and for his um, servanthood. It's giving us Christ, the God-man. And he's taken his time to craft his words very beautifully in John, but also very logical arguments. It's, it's like a very well-written short story, um, more than a theology. But in that well-written short story uh, of a true event, we get some of the most incredible uh, pictures of Christ and who he is, including one that we saw. He's the door, uh, door to the sheep. Uh, in John, there's 12 different I am statements, and that's one of them where we can understand through a simile um, what Christ is to the believer. But here we get this argument from Paul uh, that there is going to be a resurrection from the dead, that Christ will be made alive, um, or we will be made alive in Christ, just like we were made dead in Adam. Uh, that Christ is the first fruits, but also we will be resurrected at his coming. Uh, and at the very end, he will hand over his kingdom um, to God. And we'll see that again in chapter 22. Uh, and he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Uh, I didn't include a slide here to show the proof texts, but um, again and again in the New Testament epistles, especially, uh, Satan is referred to as the god of this world, the ruler of this world, the uh, ruler of this age. Uh, but here it says that Christ is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Uh, in these three different attributes that John has given him, we see the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and we see uh, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Uh, in that we see his past office of prophet, his present office of priest, and his future office of king. Uh, so we see that complete working of Christ, um, the witness, the prophet, the firstborn of the dead, uh, that sacrificial idea of the priest, and we see the ruler of the kings of the earth, not just a king of earth, uh, but the ruler of all the kings of the earth, and that pulls directly from Psalm 2. Uh, can I get a volunteer to read this? I'll read it. Thank you. Um, why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples divide and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, and the Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. Thank you. So this Psalm 2 is a prophecy of Christ. Uh, but we see it set in the context of the rulers of this world. 
that uh, they are in an uproar. They're raging against this king. They um, tear their fetters apart and they throw off the cords. Those are the, the chains that hold them bound. Uh, and in all of their, their vain uh, agony, God sits in the heavens and laughs, not because he thinks it's funny, but because it's futile because the king is coming and we'll see at that final consummation of all things, it takes no more than the words of his mouth to destroy evil. Um, he's not going to get all bloody on the battlefield fighting with the sword. Um, the words of his mouth conquer this evil. So it, it's like ants raging against the, the big human coming to stamp on him. It's not going to, doesn't even affect, um, doesn't even affect the conqueror, um, Christ, because these are just feudal kings of the earth that have no power, really. Uh, and we can apply this to today. We can look at how much is being uh, legislated and uh, against God and against Christ. I mean, uh, Sherry and I were just talking about, um, I think it was with you, Sherry, that what was it? It was about abortion, the, one of the uh, executive orders that Trump made that you can't um, let a, an attempted abortion, if it failed, um, you can't let that baby die. The fact that Trump had to make an executive order saying if this baby is born alive, you can't stick it in a linen closet and let it die. That's terrible. Uh, and the amount of abortions, in fact, my my brother just made a post on Instagram the other day. Uh, there have been more deaths in the first 11 days of 2021 by abortion than in the entire world from coronavirus. 11 days. Um, so we look at this and um, we see how many of, in America, how many of our senators think that this is uh, a woman's right that... Um, We've, we've got legislated from the bench uh, evil and against God. And you can see them shaking their fists or their gavels um, against God. And he sits in the heavens and laughs, again, not because it's funny, but because all of this will come to an end. So uh, John, in, in verse 5 here, he is likely thinking of this verse, the, the uh, wording is so very similar. And in this verse, we see the kings of the earth raging against Christ, but he is that ultimate king. And in um, this verse in Revelation, we see that he is the king of those kings. Um, so he is not going to just conquer them and take their place, but rule over them. Um, in Matthew 4, 8 through 11, we see Satan offers the kingdoms of the earth to Christ. And Christ does not deny his ability to do that. Um, and um, let's see, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and behold, the angels came and began to minister to him. So Satan was able to offer all these kingdoms to Christ because he is the owner of all of these kingdoms of the earth. Uh, but Christ is not going to have these kingdoms handed over to him or exchanged to him by Satan. He will conquer and take these kingdoms back. Uh,